So the only thing that makes a radioactive material different from a non-radioactive material is the atoms are disintegrated. The uranium atoms are gradually changing into radium atoms, and they're also changing into polonium atoms. Every atom of radon started as uranium-2. It turns out that there's two types of radiation which are non-penetrating and therefore mostly a hazard inside the body, and that's alpha and beta. The really penetrating kinds are gamma and neutrons and x-rays. Now, people in the nuclear industry will often say alpha radiation is nothing to worry about because you can stop it with a piece of paper, and that's true. But it's completely untrue that there's nothing to worry about because once it gets inside your body, it does a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, here's an actual photograph over a period of 48 hours of a little alpha particle inside lung tissue of an animal. The, the particle is going ping, 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 ping. And you see, they don't go very far, but they do a lot of damage to the cells that are right in that area. And those are the cells that might turn into cancer cells. And when that cell reproduces, it magnifies the damage over a period of years. It sometimes takes 20 years before you see a cancer developing. So for example, uranium miners working in the mine would feel perfectly fine all for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Only after that would they start developing cancers. But you know, it's very similar. When I was a kid, everybody smoked, it seems. And actually, it's very similar. In fact, it's the same phenomenon. Because smokers, they looked very glamorous. They looked happy. They didn't feel particularly sick. The only way you discover the damage that's being done is to study very carefully for many years what's happening. And that's the same with all radioactive damage. If those studies are not done, you simply don't know. Incidentally, another interesting fact is that the American Health Physics Society, that's part of the nuclear industry. The uh, health physics people are basically mostly in the nuclear industry. They, they say that polonium-210 is probably responsible for 90% of the deaths that are attributed to tobacco smoking. And this is not only the lung cancer, but also the heart attacks and strokes. It's about 250,000 deaths per year in the United States. And the reason for this is that there's very, very tiny amounts of polonium-210 that's harvested with the tobacco. Uh, we now know, and, and the people in the nuclear industry know this as well, polonium-210 is probably the most toxic material on Earth that is naturally occurring. 250 billion times more toxic than cyanide. These numbers just sort of, you know, like who can grasp these numbers? I can't. But it's obviously bad stuff. And uh, guess what? When we mine uranium, we throw it away in the waste. Now Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes because she discovered two brand new elements. She did this by gradually taking away everything that was known. And she discovered something really interesting. That even though the uranium was radioactive, the crushed rock was much more radioactive. In fact, it was about six times more radioactive. Now this is an important thing to know for anybody who is dealing with uranium mining. Because that's exactly what happens in a uranium mine. They take the rock out, they crush it, they separate the uranium, and they use it. They leave behind most of the radioactivity. That's what makes uranium mining different from other kinds of mining. Now, the other substance that Marie Curie discovered was radium. <clears throat> so radioactive that it glowed with a bright light even in the middle of the night. And this became a big business in the early 20th century. In the 1920s, for example, there were thousands of young girls, mostly teenagers, who were hired to paint the numbers on watches and on other instruments so they would glow in the dark all the time. Even though these girls were just very young, their teeth were literally falling out of their, of their mouth. So when they did autopsies on these dead women, they found that every bone in their body had become radioactive. So much so that any bone, if put on a photographic plate in a dark room overnight, would take its own picture. And yet the total amount of radium in any girl's body was only a few micrograms, which is a very small amount. So radium, the price of radium, went from $100,000 to $70,000 to $40,000 to zero. They just throw the radium away in the waste. But that, rem that radium remains in the waste for, for all human purposes forever. I now like to talk about what is nuclear waste. 
Here we have an ad from the Canadian Nuclear Association called Small Wonder. He's holding up a little uranium fuel pellet and he's saying, isn't it amazing how much energy you can get out of this little tiny thing? But what the ad doesn't tell you is that after you use this pellet to produce electricity, you cannot throw it away. You're going to have to watch it for the next 10 million years. And the reason is that the pellet has now become millions of times more radioactive than it was before it was used. As a matter of fact, here's a larger picture. And those metallic objects are called fuel bundles. They're used in Canadian nuclear reactors. Uh, it's about the size of a fireplace log, and it could be safely handled before it goes into the reactor. When it comes out of the reactor, it looks exactly the same, but it is deadly. At a distance of one meter, a man would receive a lethal dose, a deadly dose of radiation in 20 seconds. It's amazing uh, to think of that. And this is why these fuel bundles, these, these things, will never be handled by human hands ever again. Now, um, even after the fuel comes out of the reactor, it has to be cooled by circulating water for at least seven years. By the way, they only built these things to hold 10 years worth of spent fuel because they thought by that time the problem of waste would be solved. But of course, the problem has not been solved. The United States of America has tried eight different times to find a waste repository, and they have failed eight times. Now, after 10 years, they can take it out and put it into dry storage in these silos. They're called silos. And uh, my friend Bob, who took the picture, climbed up one of those ladders and is on top of one of the silos taking the picture. And the people who were conducting us on this tour didn't even know where he'd gone to. Anyway, as here in Finland, uh, the ultimate plan of the nuclear industry is to bury this stuff underground in hopes that this will put to rest the controversy. But the problem is, we don't really know how to dispose of anything. Unless we can destroy the material, nature will recycle it. And what the Nuclear Waste Disposal Program is about is about trying to tell nature to keep its hands off and you just let that stay there. We put it there, we're going to put a sign up, no nature, no recycling. Now this graph is produced by the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. It's an official document from the nuclear industry. The layers are supposed to represent layers of rock, very simple. And the red line is the um, buried radioactive waste, which is much hotter. But it's not just hotter, it's generating heat because of radioactive disintegration. So imagine putting a little heater in a box which is completely closed but not turning the heater off. If that heat cannot escape, the temperature just goes up and up and up and that's what happens when it's buried. Actually, it doesn't get that hot because it spreads through the rock. This is what happens after 4,400 years. The rock temperature is returned to approximately normal after 50,000 years. It's still about twice as hot as it was when you started, but that's close enough. So the nuclear industry, with their wonderful flair for language, they call this the thermal pulse. It's just a little blip. Because this waste remains dangerous for millions of years. This graph comes from an official government document from Canada. The blue line represents the toxic nature of the fuel over a period of 10 million years. And the point is that even after 10 million years, it's still way too toxic to allow into the environment. Now, I, well, I used to wonder why the industry was only talking about 10,000 years, or maybe even 100,000 years. But when I looked at this graph, I suddenly understood. Because the toxicity goes down for the first 100,000 years, but then it comes back up again. It's actually more toxic after 10 million years than it is after 100,000 years. And the reason for this is that inside the fuel, you have radioactive disintegration going on all the time. And so a lot of the radioactive materials are gone, but the ones that remain are continuing to produce new ones. So it turns out that the byproducts of these, these long-lived radioactive materials are worse in toxicity than the things that they started with. Um, I just asked myself, can burial actually solve the problem? And I came to the surprising conclusion that it can't. Even if geological storage was perfect, which I don't believe, it doesn't really make the surface of the earth any safer. The basic idea is this. 
As long as reactors are operating, they're going to continue to produce waste which cannot be buried for at least 30 years after the reactor has produced it. Which means that at the surface, you still have an enormous catastrophe potential. Even if you bury all the old stuff, the new stuff, which is much more toxic, actually, and much more toxic and much more uh, volatile, is still there. And to make matters worse, if you use this as a reason for expanding the industry, you build more reactors and you always have a larger and larger and larger amount of unburied waste, even if you bury it as quickly as possible.